from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome back to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and art historian currently sequestered in Florence, Italy, that fabulous city where all the great sculptors are dead, and the rest of us are under lockdown due to COVID-19. I'm recording this in late March of 2020, where developments in this pandemic are unfolding pretty quickly. So even if I were to give you a detailed update as to what Florence and Italy is currently going through, it would be out of date tomorrow. But I will say this, I am healthy. I am practicing social distancing in order not to contribute to the spread of the virus, and everyone I know and love in Florence is doing the same. I am in fact recording this in my home rather than in my studio, using a different microphone and having to deal with the noise of my cat, as well as the upstairs neighbors and their three-year-old child. Well, we're all getting through this the best we can, and right now my thoughts are turning to those outside of Italy, as the pandemic as of right now, is just getting going, and the future remains uncertain. If you are listening to this years later from when I recorded it, you will already know how this all turns out. Lucky you. So, for your sake, I'll get right down to the subject of the podcast. Now, today's podcast is a part two in conjunction with the last episode, in which I'm focusing on the period after the Peloponnesian Wars in late classical Greece, and before the death of Alexander the Great, a period which spans most of the 4th century BC and includes some of the ancient world's most prolific and important sculptors. Now, in part one, I discussed the rise of various schools of sculpture founded by the three great classical sculptors, Myron, Phidias, and Polycletus. And I talked about the sculptors and sculpture of those schools, which included notable works like the Caryatids on the Acropolis, probably by a sculptor named Alcamenes, and also The Dancing Mynad by Scopus. Well now, we're going to turn our attention to two sculptors of the 4th century who were not direct pupils of any of these schools. But in their cases, that was a good thing. See, these two sculptors stand out for their originality, and as well as for being the two most prolific and celebrated Greek sculptors of their century, Praxiteles and Lysippus. Now, we're going to begin with Praxiteles, a name you're probably familiar with, a name as well-known as Phidias or Polycletus. We probably know more about Praxiteles than any other sculptor of his time, in fact, due to the writings of several classical authors, as well as innumerable copies and copies of copies of his work. And he made a lot of sculpture, mostly in marble. Now, I mentioned in the last episode that Scopus, well, he also worked mostly in marble, which bucked the trend from earlier generations who focused on bronze statuary. Now, the reason for the switch back to marble sculpture from the fashionable and expensive bronze statues of Polycletus and his followers was probably an economic choice. The endless wars between the Greek city-states took a toll on the economy, and a statue in marble was just cheaper to produce than one in bronze. Anyway, we don't know when Praxiteles was born or when he died, exactly, but best guesses place his work in life between 370 and 330 BC. He was an Athenian, and he was the son of a minor sculptor named Cephasodotus, whose few known works don't seem to reflect an adherence to any of the classical schools, particularly, though there is a possible master-pupil lineage that goes back to the school of Myron, but it doesn't really manifest itself in the work of either father or son. But what makes the work of Praxiteles stand out is its sensuality, and there's just no better word for it. Now, in the last episode, uh, you remember I talked about the sculptor Scopus. Scopus was the creator of the sculpture of Pothos, the minor god of yearning and longing, the companion of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. He also created a very sensual and passionate dancing mynad, which I just mentioned. And this rendering of passion and emotion in large sculpture was something new. What also was new were the poses that Scopus gave his figures. Now, if you remember, I mentioned the figure of Pothos was leaning heavily on some drapery or a pedestal in a pose that broke with the popular formulas of contraposto set out by Polycletus and his school. Well, if the style of Praxiteles descends from any sculptor, it certainly comes from Scopus, 
In fact, the two were the same age, and some sources indicate that they may have actually worked together. So whether Scopus copied Praxiteles, or the other way around, or if the two did indeed work together and evolved a similar style alongside one another, all that's up for debate. And there are several sculptures in existence whose attribution to one sculptor or the other is also up for debate. But where the work of Scopus seems centered on passion, we find a dreamy, languid sensuality to the work of Praxiteles. Let's take a look at a few of his works. Uh, we'll start with the one known as Apollo Soronctinus, or Apollo the Lizard Slayer. Now, as always, you can find the image for this and other works at the image gallery for this episode, which is episode number 82 at thesculptorsfuneral.com. Just go to the homepage, click on the image gallery link, and scroll to the bottom of the page for that link. So, Apollo Soronctinus, Apollo the Lizard Slayer. What we see in this statue is a youthful Apollo, standing nude and leaning on the trunk of a tree with one arm, in a leaning pose that is very similar to the Pothos statue by Scopus. Crawling up the trunk of the tree is a rather large lizard, and the young Apollo is poking at the lizard with an arrow in a lazy, playful manner. Hardly a lizard slayer. Now, this motif may be a playful reference to a story in the mythology of Apollo when he fights the dragon-like serpent named Python that lived in the center of the earth. And in this work, we see several aspects of the style of Praxiteles which recur in a lot of his known sculpture, or at least in copies of his known work. The languid, leaning pose, for one thing, and the youthfulness of the subject, for another. See, Praxiteles sculpted really only the youthful gods, like Apollo or Hermes, rather than gods like Zeus and Poseidon, which typically had a more mature appearance. Also, what is interesting here, and what we'll see in some more of Praxiteles' work, is the creative use of the third leg. Now, as you probably know, a third leg in sculpture is the necessary structural support in marble figure sculpture, which keeps a statue from cracking at the ankles. Think of the tree trunk behind the leg of Michelangelo's David, for an example. Well, with Praxiteles, we find the first instances of a sculptor who really endeavors to include the third leg as an integral part of the composition. Apollo, here, is interacting with the tree trunk in a way we don't find in the figures of earlier sculptors. With the possible exception of the Pothos by Scopus, who originally leaned on a figure of Aphrodite, this Apollo Soronctinus is the earliest figure I can think of which fully integrates the third leg as an essential part of the composition. Now, another languid, leaning, youthful figure from Praxiteles is one of the most recognizable sculptures of ancient Greece, and it's the one that has put Praxiteles on the map for modern art lovers. It's the statue known as Hermes with the Infant Dionysus, although I hear it commonly referred to as simply the Hermes. And it's famous for a few reasons. One is that it's a fairly recent discovery, dug up in excavations at the collapsed Temple of Hera in Olympia, Greece. And the temple collapsed in the 3rd century AD, but excavations got underway only in the 19th century. And in 1877, the statue of Hermes was found, and it created a bit of a sensation, more so than other similar statues found in archaeological excavations of the time, and all because of a brief description in the travel history of Pausanias, the Roman travel writer from the 2nd century AD. In his description of the Temple of Hera, which Pausanias studied firsthand, he mentions in a single sentence a marble statue of Hermes holding the infant Dionysus made by Praxiteles. Now, clearly, the statue found in 1877 was the same described by Pausanias, which makes the Hermes one of the very few original Greek statues surviving today from one of the greatest of the Greek sculptors, with a more solid provenance than just about any other Greek statue. Now, another reason for its fame and popularity is its superb quality. Now, remember that the majority of 5th and 4th century statues are known to us only through Roman copies, and copies can be more or less accurate, and the copyists themselves were of varying talent. But with the Hermes, we see the hand of the master himself, and the difference between this work and any copies of the work of Praxiteles is clear. And the crazy thing is, the Hermes wasn't even one of the more celebrated works by Praxiteles. It was seemingly never copied by Roman copyists. The original marble is the only one we know of. 
so you can just imagine the quality of the original work that Praxiteles was famous for. But if you compare the quality of the original Hermes to the copy of the Apollo the Lizard Slayer, or another copy of Praxiteles' work known as the Resting Satyr, which is in the Capitoline Museum in Rome, you compare any of these, and you'll see how, in comparison, the original Hermes is head and shoulders above the copies of his more celebrated works. But even before the discovery of the Hermes in 1877, Praxiteles had captured the imagination of art lovers and history lovers over the centuries, in large part due to the poems and odes written about his work, but even more so to the tantalizing story recorded by many classical writers of the relationship Praxiteles had with the most famous courtesan in ancient Greece, a woman known as Phryn. Now, Phryn was not her real name. Her real name was Misereti, but her nickname was Phryn, which in ancient Greek meant toad, and apparently people called her that because of her olive complexion. Bit of a strange nickname for one of the most renowned beauties in ancient Greece, but there you go. Now, Phryn was a courtesan. In other words, a high-class prostitute. Now, the life of Phryn as we know it is as mythological as any story about Aphrodite or Zeus, full of fun anecdotes, most of which praise her unparalleled beauty as well as her intelligence and character. However, she absolutely was a real person, born in around 371 BC in Thespe to a man named Epicles, who moved his family to Athens. Now, among her many stories, it is said of her that at the religious festivals dedicated to Poseidon, she would strip off all her clothes at the beach and step into the surf naked for all to see, an act which helped advertise her beauty to clients and to artists alike. You see, she modeled for artists as a side gig, supposedly posing for the famous Athenian painter, Apelles, who painted her as Venus rising from the sea. And she also posed for Praxiteles. And what's more, Praxiteles took her as his lover. Now, it's uncertain if their relationship was more romantic than transactional. There are stories that sort of support either side of that argument. Anyway, several ancient writers record that Praxiteles made for Phryn a statue, perhaps even two of them. Pausanias elaborates on this story. Phryn once asked of him the most beautiful of his works, and the story goes that, lover-like, he agreed to give it, but refused to say which he thought was the most beautiful. So a slave of Phryn rushed in, saying that a fire had broken out in the studio of Praxiteles, and the greater number of his works were lost, although not all were destroyed. Praxiteles at once started to rush through the door, crying that his labor was all wasted, if indeed the flames had caught his satyr and his eros. But Phryn bade him stay and be of good courage. For he had suffered no grievous loss, but he had been trapped into confessing which were the most beautiful of his works. And so Phryn chose the statue of Eros. Another writer, Geminus, adds to this story that out of gratitude for the statue of Eros, Phryn let Praxiteles make love to her at no extra charge. Isn't that sweet? Now, although the statue which Phryn chose does not survive, the statue of Eros, we do have fragments of copies of Praxiteles' satyr, which you can find, again, in the image gallery for this episode. Now, the culmination of the relationship between Praxiteles and Phryn, at least as concerns sculpture, resulted in a statue for which Phryn posed, the Aphrodite of Nidos, sometimes called the Nidian Venus, but we're talking Greek sculpture here, so it's more properly referred to as Aphrodite, Aphrodite being the, the uh, Greek god and, and Venus being the Roman equivalent. Now, anyway, the Roman writer, Pliny the Elder, described this sculpture in his book, The Natural History. Superior to all the statues, not only of Praxiteles, but of any other artist that ever existed, is his Nidian Venus for the inspection of which many persons before now have purposefully undertaken a voyage to Nidos. The artist made two statues of the goddess and offered them both for sale. One of them was represented with drapery and for this reason was preferred by the people of Kos, who had the choice. The second was offered them at the same price, but on the grounds of propriety and modesty, they thought fit to choose the other. Upon this, the Nidians purchased the rejected statue and immensely superior has it always been held in general estimation. At a later period, King Nicomedes wished to purchase this statue of the Nidians, 
and made them an offer to pay off the whole of their public debt, which was very large. They preferred, however, to submit to any extremity rather than to part with it, and with good reason, for by this statue Praxiteles has perpetuated the glory of Nidos. The little temple in which it is placed is open on all sides, so that the beauties of the statue admit of being seen from every point of view, an arrangement which was favored by the goddess herself, it is generally believed. Indeed, from whatever point it is viewed, its execution is equally worthy of admiration. Now a certain individual, it is said, became enamored of this statue, and, concealing himself in the temple during the night, gratified his lustful passion upon it, traces of which are to be seen in a stain left upon the marble. TMI, Pliny the Elder. But at least that last bit about the stain on the statue caused by some pervy ancient Greek, well, that story is illuminating in one aspect. It shows that for as long as nude women have been depicted in art, they have been reduced to sexual objects. But the Aphrodite of Nidos isn't just a statue of a beautiful and famous woman made by a famous sculptor. It's the first of its kind in Greece, the first large-scale statue of a female nude. It seems kind of difficult to believe because, I mean, male nude statuary was being introduced in Greece in the 7th century BC. But it wasn't until Praxiteles in the middle of the 4th century that we finally see the same thing with the feminine form. The Greek reluctance to render the female nude in large statuary was uh, as much a matter of well-established artistic conventions, which depicted Aphrodite clothed, as it was a moral convention. But once Praxiteles broke with those conventions, there was no turning back. As Pliny points out, it was a sensation, and this statue was such a popular sculpture in ancient Greece and Rome that well over 100 copies of the work are still with us. Just about any Aphrodite or Venus statue you can think of traces its lineage directly back to the Aphrodite of Nidos. The Capitoline Venus, the Venus de' Medici, the Barberini Venus, the Borghese Venus, and the Venus Colonna are all copies of the original Aphrodite of Nidos, with the Venus Colonna being recognized as the most faithful to the original when compared with coins minted at Nidos bearing the image of the original statue. But the body type that Praxiteles composed with this one work has wholly informed the notion of the Greek ideal of the feminine form. It serves as the exemplar for the works of not just later Hellenistic sculptors, but just about any classicist sculptor coming along after, from Giambologna to Canova to Hiram Powers. The Aphrodite of Nidos is one of the most influential, possibly the most influential sculpture in the history of Western sculpture. I'd say that if the Western tradition of figurative sculpture has parents, well, the Doriferous of Polyclitus would be the father, and the Aphrodite of Praxiteles the mother. Now, Praxiteles is regarded as one of the greatest of the 4th century BC, but as we've seen, he is by no means the only sculptor, and there's another who can give Praxiteles a run for his money when it comes to fame and influence, and that is Lysippus. We're going to hear all about him when the sculptor's funeral continues. <music> Wow, what a time to be alive, guys. I hope each and every one of you is taking good care of yourself and of each other. Now, I'm sure you've heard it from millions of other sources, but social distancing saves lives. Now, even if you are well out of the range of the demographic most likely to be taken down by COVID-19, please think of others around you and think of your community, which includes people you may have not met. So in addition to the lockdown here in Italy, the pandemic is affecting my life in pretty grand ways. For starters, my uh, summer tour of workshops is now drastically altered. As of this recording, I've canceled pretty much everything in my Australian and U.S. legs of my tour. My hopes are still pinned on my U.K. tours, which take place in August, and I'm just hoping life is normalized enough by then but I imagine it will be a, a new normal rather than a matter of getting back to normal. I think this is going to change how we live from here on out, and hopefully in some good ways. But it's early yet, so we'll see. Anyway, in, in addition to uh, workshops canceling, I haven't had a student in my Florence studio for going on a month with no students to be seen for the foreseeable future. And I myself haven't been to my own studio for a couple weeks. I live out in the countryside just outside of Florence in a little farmhouse. So 
you know, I've got a nice garden and I'm isolated, uh, you know, as isolated as I want to be. But I can still get out into some fresh air and some sunshine. So it's pretty, pretty all right. But for now, studio, uh, you know, trips to the studio, they're just out. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the lockdown very seriously. And I hope you are all doing the same as regards whatever precautions are in place where you are. And, um, you know, actually, the time off has been pretty nice for me, all except for the you know, the looming financial disaster that awaits me. Uh, but I, I think it's going to affect a lot, of, uh, a lot of you out there too, eventually, if it hasn't already. So buckle up. On the bright side, as I sink into bankruptcy, I'm going to use my time at home wisely. In fact, you can thank the coronavirus for this episode coming out when it did. Uh, as you regular listeners know, I've been pretty slack in getting episodes out in the last few years. Uh, also, I'm, I'm going to be doing... Uh, something a little different in the podcast in the next coming episodes, something that'll be a lot of fun for everyone, um, kind of a completely different format and focus for a series of Sculptor's Funeral episodes. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, the only other news that I have to report is that I'm finally going to get to work in earnest on the writing project that I started way back in 2011, a project that eventually actually led to the Sculptor's Funeral and to my evolution into the art historian I am today. Uh, It's a book about the development of the clay modeling processes and techniques that started with Francois Rude, which, you know, passed to the likes of Carpeau and Jules Deleu and to England and to the U.S. in in the late 19th century. I'll also be working finally on the uh, second edition to my site size sculpture manual, something I've been, oh, wanting to do for about 15 years or so. And I'm sure you're all finding things to do at home as well during these strange times. Just remember, you're not alone. Reach out to each other. Be there for each other, all right? And uh, be as productive as you're able. So, Lysippus, the other giant of the 4th century. He stands in contrast to Praxiteles in a few different ways. Now, while Praxiteles had a career that seemed to span about 40 years, from around 370 to 330 BC, which is a good long time, Lysippus seems to have lived and worked for even longer. We find Lysippus was born around 390 BC, about the same time as Praxiteles, and documents show that he was active as a sculptor to at least 316 BC, at which point he would have been around 75 years old. Now, the first thing to note about Lysippus is that we don't know who he studied under. Indeed, Pliny the Elder records that Lysippus of Sicyon was nobody's pupil. Originally a bronze smith, he joined the discipline after hearing a response from the painter Eupompus. When asked which of his predecessors he followed, Eupompus pointed to a crowd of people and said it was nature herself, not another artist, whom one should imitate. I really like that quote. Um, who knows if it's in any way true, but uh, this quote does, in a single sentence, sum up the character of the work of Lysippus, because he more than most sculptors of classical Greece, followed nature as the path to beauty, rather than following a canon of proportion or a stylistic precedent. Pliny elaborates on this. Lysippus is said to have contributed much to the art of sculpture by rendering the hair in more detail, by making the heads of his figures smaller than the old sculptors used to do, and the bodies slenderer and leaner to give his statues the appearance of greater height. Latin has no word for the symmetry which he most scrupulously preserved by a new and hitherto untried system that modified the four square figures of the ancients. And he used to say publicly that while they had made men as they were, he made them as they appeared to be. A distinguishing characteristic of his is seen to be the scrupulous attention to detail maintained in even the smallest particulars. So when Pliny talks about the four square figures of the ancients, he is directly referring to the canon of Polycletus, the organization of the parts of the body, and even the organization of the features of the face in the work of Polycletus and his followers, is sometimes referred to as four square, due to the consideration of symmetry from left to right and from top to bottom. Also in this quote, Pliny talks about how Lysippus made his heads smaller than Polycletus did, and if you look at much of Polycletian work, the figures do indeed appear to be fairly stocky, maybe no taller than 
five foot seven or so, due to their proportions and the size of the head relative to the height of the figure. Essentially, the figures of Polyclitus are about seven heads high. In Lysippus, we find his figures to be about eight heads high. But for me, the most intriguing statement of that Pliny quote that I just read is how Lysippus, quote, used to say publicly that while they had made men as they were, he made them as they appeared to be. Now, this is similar to a sentiment I often hear and repeat myself when talking about the difference between realism and naturalism in sculpture. Realism, so the saying goes, is to render what is there, present in the model. But naturalism is to render what you see is there in the model. Now, it would appear that Lysippus is the grandfather of naturalism in sculpture, at least where the artist's intentions are concerned. So this dualism in, uh, in representational art, the tension between nature and the ideal, that's still with us today, of course, and it seems to be the continuation of a conversation started back in the 4th century BC. The difference in approach and aesthetic between Polyclitus and Lysippus is similar in nature to the differences between Donatello and Michelangelo, between Canova and Udon, or between Lorenzo Bartolini and Giovanni Dupre. And if Pliny the Elder is to be believed, Lysippus was self-taught. Now, that may have been the case, we'll never really know. But historians and art connoisseurs have always detected a strong link between the work of Lysippus and that of Polyclitus, despite their differences. You see, there exists in both a grace and a fluid subtlety, certain qualities that are really encapsulated in the 18th century art critic Johannes Wankelmann's famous phrase, calm simplicity and noble grandeur. It's like these two sculptors had the same aims, but took different routes to get there. So much so that Lysippus is often referred to, incorrectly, as being a part of the school of Polyclitus, or even a student of his. Of course, not directly, as Polyclitus was dead before Lysippus was born. But it stands to reason that if Lysippus was more or less self-taught, he likely would have proceeded, at least at first, by emulation of the old masters. And it's almost impossible to imagine that Lysippus did not make good use of the only sculpture manual in existence in the 4th century, the Canon, by Polyclitus. So Lysippus starts with Polyclitus, but then he goes his own way, retaining what he finds useful and evolving the theories and practice of Polyclitus to suit his own thinking. Let's take a look at a few of Lysippus's works. Now, Unlike Praxiteles, his contemporary, who worked almost exclusively in marble, Lysippus worked exclusively in bronze, which, sadly, means that we don't have any positively attributed originals. Now, there is a possibility that the figure known as the Victorious Youth, or as the Getty Bronze, in the Getty Museum in California, is a bronze original by Lysippus. It's possible. It was found off the coast of Italy in the 1960s, dredged up by a fishing boat, and while the victorious youth has the proportions of a Lysippin work, as well as the languid sort of pose he seemed to have in common with Praxiteles, we cannot say for certain if it's by Lysippus himself, or if it's by one of his many pupils or followers or imitators. You see, Lysippus was said to have a very large, pretty much an industrial scale workshop, and he produced, it is said, over a thousand statues in his career. And Lysippus, of course, would go on to become one of the old masters for the next several generations after him, so we really don't know if this is an original by his hand or maybe a first-century work by an imitator of his style. Now, one work we can definitely attribute to Lysippus, or at least identify as a copy of a Lysippus, is the work called Apoximenos, or The Scraper. It's a marble statue of an athlete scraping the skin of his arm with a little scraper called a strigil. Now, it's how athletes would clean the sweat and dust off of themselves after a wrestling competition or some other exercise. Now, several versions and variants of this work exist in both marble and bronze, and the most famous one is at the Museo Pio Clementino in Rome, where it's known as the Vatican Apoximenos. And if you take a look at the image of this Apoximenos, and you know where to go for that, we can see several points of departure from the style of his presumed influence, Polyclitus. First and foremost is the body type and proportions. Placing the Apoximenos side by side to the spear bearer or Doriferous of Polyclitus, the Doriferous seems short and thick 
compared to the taller, more elegantly proportioned Apoximenos. And looking at the head of Apoximenos, we can't help but wonder if this isn't a portrait. It certainly has more individuality in the features than the standard classical 5th century head, with its fleshy cheeks and close-set eyes, and eye sockets that seem more the result of observation rather than some sort of schematic formula. And his hair is even sort of kind of messed up, as though he had just finished some sort of physical exertion. Touches of individuality and naturalism such as these are the hallmarks of Lysippin style, and we'll see that touch of individuality emulated throughout much of the next century. And I want you to note also the impulse towards a narrative with this work. This isn't a statue of an athlete crowning himself with laurels, as we find in the victorious youth. It's a statue of an athlete just cleaning up, performing a rather banal task. It's sort of a slice-of-life scene, meant to convey the essential humanity of the subject, rather than to glorify it. It's the same impulse towards narrative that we see in some of Praxiteles' works, like The Lizard Slayer. It would seem as though, in the 4th century, the quasi-religious pursuit of a godlike ideal in figurative sculpture has devolved somewhat into something more human, more individualistic, and, with its focus on narrative and detail, more crowd-pleasing. And the Greeks, as well as the Romans later on, loved the Apoximenos. Pliny the Elder recounts a story about its popularity later on in the Roman Empire when the original had been transported to Rome. Lysippus was most prolific in his works, and made more statues than any other artist. Among these is the man using the body scraper, which Marcus Agrippa had erected in front of his hot baths, and which wonderfully pleased the emperor Tiberius. The emperor, who in the beginning of his reign had imposed some restraint upon himself, could not resist the temptation, and had this statue removed to his bedchamber, having substituted another for it at the baths. The people, however, were so resolutely opposed to this that, at the theater, they clamorously demanded the Apoximenos be replaced, and the emperor, notwithstanding his attachment to it, was obliged to restore it. Now, once sculpture opened itself up to the pursuit of rendering people as they appeared to be, as Lysippus would say, it opened itself up to the range and scope of humanity itself in all its variety. An excellent example of this is a work by Lysippus called The Weary Hercules, but it's more popularly known as the Farnese Hercules, and it's in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Now, we presume the bronze original by Lysippus would have been about life-size, but the marble copy we see in Naples was enlarged by a later Roman copyist to be placed at the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. Now, this statue stands over 10 feet tall, more than 3 meters, and it's like nothing yet seen in the ancient world. It's a hulking brute of a Hercules, wearily leaning on his club, which he uses as sort of a crutch, ostensibly tired after completing the first of his twelve labors, the killing of the Nemean lion. The skin of the lion is draped over his club, and, and one of Hercules' arms is sort of bent behind his back, and in that hand he holds the apples of the Hesperides, which are golden apples from the garden of the goddess Hera, the stolen fruits of another of the labors of Hercules. Now in this work, the uh, Polycletian ideal of symmetry is entirely absent, as Hercules leans strongly to one side. The proportions of this figure come from a heavily muscled living model, rather than any sort of canon or formula that we've yet seen. And most striking about the Hercules, when compared to figures which precede it, is the face. This could only be the portrait of the type of person who could inhabit this massive body with his heavy brow and his boxer's nose and his full beard. There is as much that separates this work from the classical 5th century as separates the work of the classical 5th century from the archaic period. We've truly entered into a new age. Now, throughout history, there have been a lot of excellent sculptors whose work breaks new ground and ushers in a development of some sort, an evolution of the status quo in statue making. And when that occurrence coincides with a change in the larger world of politics or culture, that excellent sculptor then becomes one of the greats, because the work of that sculptor then becomes attached to its zeitgeist. 
Now think of the inexorable association of Michelangelo with the Renaissance, or of Bernini with the Counter-Reformation, or Canova with the Enlightenment. Well, it happened with Lysippus as well. Lysippus is the sculptor whose work will forever be associated with the rise of Hellenism. Now you've heard me use that word a lot, and, and now it's finally time to fully explain just what is meant by Hellenism. So, to the north of Greece lay the nation of Macedon, ruled by a dynastic king named Philip II. This ancient kingdom was essentially culturally Greek, though a little too far north to have participated in the glories of classical Greece, or to be embroiled with the Persian Wars, or the Delian League, or, or any of the endless struggles between Sparta, Athens, and Thebes for control of Greece in the first half of the 4th century. And it may well have continued on as such, had it not been for Philip II. Philip was a wise politician and a brave military commander, the kind of person who could alter the fate of a country single-handedly, in the mold of a Pericles or a Xerxes. Coming to the throne in 359 BC, Philip reorganized his military, established novel battle tactics such as the Macedonian phalanx, and over the course of the next 20 years, through military success and diplomacy, managed to subdue most of Greece, slowly chipping away at Theban and Athenian control, territory by territory, sometimes in battle and sometimes by alliance. Finally, in 338 BC, Philip defeated the Theban and Athenian alliance outright and ruled most of Attica and the Peloponnese, with the exception of Sparta. Philip instituted a league of his own, the Corinthian League, though the seat of power lay north in Macedon. But what concerns us isn't the reign of Philip II over Greek territory, but rather the life of his son, Alexander. The young Alexander was raised in the way aristocratic Macedonians were. He learned to read, he learned to fight, learned to ride a horse, and to hunt. But when he turned 13, Alexander needed a tutor, and his father, Philip, hired none other than the philosopher Aristotle to school the young Alexander in philosophy, logic, rhetoric, morals, and even art. A small school developed during Aristotle's years tutoring Alexander, which included many of Alexander's Macedonian childhood friends, who would later become Alexander's generals, including Ptolemy and Hephaestion. Alexander's father, Philip, was assassinated in 336 BC, elevating the 20-year-old Alexander to the throne of Macedon and to become the ruler of Greece. Alexander immediately embarked on a military career unparalleled in world history, beginning with a successful invasion of Persia, which led to the end of the Persian Empire, but then onwards, east, conquering Syria and what is now Turkey in one year, Egypt the next, Assyria and Babylon the year after that. Alexander never lost. He founded new cities everywhere he went, most of them named after himself, like Alexandria in Egypt, and what is now Kandahar in modern-day Afghanistan. He delegated local rule of various regions to his Macedonian generals, he founded Greek colonies, and spread Greek culture further east than had been achieved previously, effectively creating a legacy of Greek culture we now refer to as Hellenism, encompassing the eastern half of the Mediterranean from Macedonia to Egypt and eastward all the way to India. Alexander the Great, as he is known, never returned to Macedonia, but died, probably by poisoning, in Babylonia in 323 BC, at the age of 32. He ruled and fought for only 13 years, but he changed the face of Greece and the Mediterranean forever. His death was sudden, creating a power vacuum in his empire, which was settled after 40 years of fighting between his successors and his generals, which eventually divided the kingdom of Alexander the Great into four regions. Egypt, ruled by the descendants of Alexander's general Ptolemy. You have the Middle East and Mesopotamia, ruled by Seleucus, another general, which became known as the Seleucid Empire. And then you have the Adelid Empire in Asia Minor, or what is now modern-day Turkey. And you have the Antigonid Empire in Macedonia. Now, these four empires lasted until the sublimation into the Roman Empire a few centuries later. But in their time, each of these four empires spread Greek language and culture and education, governance, and art throughout their territories. And when the Romans eventually swept these territories into their control, Greek culture was an inseparable aspect of these acquisitions. Now, 
back to Lysippus. Now, assuming a birth date around 390 BC, that means Lysippus would have been in his mid-50s when Alexander succeeded his father, and about 70 when Alexander died. And this period of the career of Lysippus seems to have been one of his more fruitful periods, as he was the favorite sculptor of Alexander the Great. We can go back to Pliny the Elder to get an idea of what Lysippus made for Alexander. He made many studies of Alexander the Great, beginning with one in his boyhood. He also made a Hephaestian, Alexander's friend, an Alexander's hunt, dedicated at Delphi, a satyr, now in Athens, and Alexander's squadron, in which he rendered the portraits of his friends with the highest degree of likeness possible in every case. He also made chariot groups of various kinds. Now let's talk a little bit about these chariot groups. First off, a chariot group is known in sculpture more formally as a quadriga. Now, a quadriga is a specific type of chariot pulled by four horses, used both by charioteers in the games at Olympus and also by the god Apollo in driving the sun across the sky. And beginning with Lysippus, the quadriga became a staple component of monumental commemorations of victory or triumph. You can find quadrigas on the top of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, the Wellington Arch in London, and at the Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn, New York. So you might imagine that Alexander the Great had a use for such things. As for the quadrigas of Lysippus, there isn't much to say about them because none survive. But there is a persistent myth that the four bronze horses at St. Mark's Basilica in Venice are from the hand of Lysippus. They are the only surviving quadriga in bronze from classical antiquity, but likely date from the 2nd century A.D. No one knows exactly what they were made for, but they eventually graced the Hippodrome in Constantinople, where the Venetians looted them in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade, taking them back to Venice with them. Pliny also mentioned a series of portraits he made of Alexander and his so-called squadron. Now let's hear from Plutarch for more information on that, specifically about the portrait bust of Alexander the Great himself. When Lysippus had finished his first Alexander, with his face looking up towards the heavens, just as Alexander himself was accustomed to look, slightly inclining his neck to one side, someone, not inappropriately, inscribed the following epigram. This statue seems to look at Zeus and say, Take thou, Olympus. Me, let earth obey. For this, Alexander ordered that Lysippus alone should make his portraits, for only he, it seemed, brought out his real character in the bronze and gave form to his essential excellence. Sadly, like most original bronzes, we don't have this bronze portrait of Alexander from the hand of Lysippus, but its fame, as well as the fame and power of Alexander, meant that this head was copied countless times. There exist several versions, at least one of which you're probably familiar. At the image gallery, I'm showing the one in the British Museum. But if you Google Alexander Lysippus, you'll find a dozen more in various levels of quality and preservation. And from the British Museum example, you can see that Plutarch's description was dead on. The head is turned sharply to one side, and the lips are parted as though he were speaking or about to speak. Its quality might not impress us as much as it impressed the ancients, but that's because we're very used to seeing this sort of portrait bust, the, the speaking likeness with the parted lips, the turn of the head suggesting movement in the rest of the body, which is not there. This sort of bust gives us an idea of not only what a person looked like, but insight into that subject's character. He's a man of action, a man who lived and spoke. Now, this sort of thing was new. And this expression of the parted lips and turned head was copied in the work of other sculptors so much that it actually has a name now. It's called the Lysippin Gaze. This isn't the first portrait bust we've seen from ancient Greece. Just in the last episode, I mentioned the famous bust of Pericles by the sculptor Cresilus. And that bust, the one of Pericles, is presumably a faithful record of what Pericles looked like. But we get no sense of his character apart from what is given to us by way of his war helmet. It doesn't move, it doesn't speak, it doesn't live like the bust of Alexander does. The bust of Alexander has life and narrative and character, and it is one of the earliest busts to exhibit these qualities. Lysippus seems to have been the first to realize you can encapsulate character in this way. In a certain expressive sense, it really is the first 
self-portrait bust. And it makes perfect sense that the genre should originate with the sculptor who strived to make sculptures of his subjects not as they are, but as they appear. Thanks again for listening. And welcome to those of you who have recently found the podcast. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank Jory Finkel, a journalist and critic, uh, for the inclusion of the podcast on her list of binge-worthy art podcasts to listen to during the pandemic, which was published by the New York Times recently. Big time. The podcast uh, received a bit of a ratings bump from that, for which I thank you. And if you are new, or if you're a longtime listener, you can check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook group page. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or the dozens of other podcast apps out there, and you can receive the podcast automatically on your PC, tablet, or mobile device as soon as new episodes air. And if you want to help out the podcast reaching other people, go ahead and leave a review or give the podcast a rating wherever you subscribe. Also, as always, at the SculptorsFuneral.com website, you can stream the complete archives of the show, you can check out the image galleries for this and for other episodes, and you can support the podcast by buying some Sculptor's Funeral merchandise or by making a donation. And finally, you can click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, at the SculptorsFuneral.com. Clicking on the link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast, and for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week. <laughs>